welcome back, especially for those who are stuck in the snow. I don't know where you are, but we had about, well, I was shoveling about three feet of snow out in the backyard, so um, we had some snow. So I'm wearing white to blend in so I can be camouflaged. Okay, let's pick up where we left off. Um, Jesus has talked to the crowd and referred to himself as the Son of Man. Now, I saved that for this week because it's really important. And some Bibles translate them, and our, our current lectionary translate. I was stunned when I heard the translation as uh, one like, he saw one like a human being. It's like, you know, the Son of Man is, is a specific title. It's, it's not, you know, it's not daughter of woman, son of man. It's, it's this theological concept. Um, it is from the book of Daniel, who was this glorious figure um, to receive, we were going to receive from God during the, the end times and, and have an eternal rule. Uh, Jesus uses this title, son of man, for himself ten times in John's gospel. Up to this passage, he's referred to himself as the Son of Man throughout the Gospel. He will continue, and then uh, it comes up in Acts of the Apostles, it comes up in the book of Revelation. Um, but in terms of the Gospels, this is the only Gospel uh, that recounts that. Remember, John's Gospel is a theology book. It's not just a, a writings, it's not a historical record, it's a, it's a theological record. Um, and you'd think, well, because we so often call him the Son of God, and we don't call anyone else Son of God. Um, it, it's because our understanding of Son of God is different than their understanding of Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God in, in a very true sense, that he was, uh, he's, he's part of God the Father. Um, but for the mindset of, of the people up to Jesus' time, we were all sons and daughters of God. We were created by God, and so we are called to be his children. Mind you, we constantly stray from that, but that's our call. Um, son of man was an indication that God was going to do something different. Uh, and For us, it's the word made flesh. It is God become human. And so when Jesus refers to that title, Son of Man, it's God has done something new. God has something done something different. God has become man. God has become human and is present to you. Um, it's important because it's how Jesus identifies himself and, and what we would say he relates to his divinity. And we'll hear more and more as Jesus goes on in John's Gospel linking that divinity to Christ. Jesus claims to have the seal on him. Um, and we, we hear about that seal in Matthew and, and John's Gospel and in Daniel. That seal is the gift Jesus received at baptism. The God the Holy Spirit who came upon him bodily. The third person of the Trinity. Um, and between the Son of Man and the work of the Holy Spirit, we see the Trinity starting to manifest in our lives, starting to recognize, oh, oh, that's true what it is. So let's continue on John chapter 6, being mindful that son of man is not a sexist term, or may have been, but um, it is a theological term. He was talking to the uh, people who had witnessed what he had done, and we continue with that. Then they said to him, what must we do if we are to carry out God's work. Jesus gave them this answer. This is carrying out God's work. You must believe in the one he has sent. So they said, what sign will you yourself do? The sight of which will make us believe in you. What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. Our scripture says he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, Uh, 
clicked the wrong thing here. I... Uh, the, the Greek word for do or doing is used three times here. What must we do? What sign will you do? What work will you do? Um, the literal translation, and you can understand why we don't translate things literally because um, they'd be more confusing, um, is what must we be doing to be doing the doings of God? <laughs> kind of redundant. You would not pass an a, a English class with that. The people still don't understand that it does not depend on them. They're thinking, okay, what do we have to do to do the will and the work of God? And for those of you who heard this story before, I apologize, but when I was doing retreats at Graymore, I used to meet with people in the library, one-on-one uh, -on, -one on Saturday afternoon. And I will say, for the most part, it was men more than women, although I ran across this with women as well. Uh, there was a grand piano, still is a grand piano in the library at Graymore. And I'd hear a person talking to me about the things they need to do, the things that, that they, they, they must be doing uh, to do the work of God. So I would ask, you see that piano over there? Can you pick that up? Now, on the, on the plus side, most women would say, no. But most men would say, um, well, uh, I, have, I have some friends on retreat with me. We could probably move it for you. Where do you want it moved? I said, no, no, no. Can, can you pick it up? Well, I see it's on wheels. I could probably, you know, roll it someplace. Where do you want it to go? I said, can you pick up that piano? And almost embarrassed, like, I should be able to do that. They put their heads down and say, no. I can't. I said, then why do you try? Why do you try to do the work of God? Just as these people were saying, what do we have to do to do the doings of God? <laughs> um, we want to do the will of God, but we can't do the work of God. We can barely do the work of ourselves. What we should be asking is, what am I being asked to do? God is not asking us to do his job. We're not equipped for it. We are not, it's not possible for us. I cannot pick up that grand piano. So I'd say to them, you know, maybe you could pick up the bench. Or maybe not even that. Maybe you can just hold a piece of sheet music. And God picks up the piano and he puts it down. And then you put the music on it. And together, beautiful music is played. That, that's all we can do. And we so often think, oh, this is nothing. You know, I, sh I should be able to do that. You know, I'm, I'm not holy enough. No, it's, it's not about us. It's not about what do we need to do to do God's work, but rather what do, is God asking me to do my work? What's the job God has given me? And it's going to be different for every one of us. Um, but we spend an awful lot of time wasting energy thinking, I should be doing this or I should be doing that, instead of saying, what am I supposed to be doing, God? What are you asking me to do? God is not stupid. He's not going to say, okay, I want you to go and pick that piano up. I want you to go do the impossible. Because um, it's impossible. Remember what Jesus would say, for us it is impossible for God, all things are possible. And so here he's running into people who are trying to figure out, what can I do? Well, you can do what you can do for God's will. And Jesus doesn't give them something to do. He gives them something to believe. What you can do is have faith in the one he sent. Oh. Can you give me something to do instead? <laughs> um, gee, having faith, I don't, I don't know about that. Jesus says, just believe in him. 
and stop trying to do it by yourself because we can't do it by ourselves. If we continue to try, to try doing everything by our own power, we miss the doings of God. That is, Jesus as Messiah. We, we're not looking for it because we think we need to do it when, we, when it's impossible for us. Jesus came as the new Moses, and he's telling them what Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy. It's the same verse that Jesus quoted Satan in the, uh, the temptation in the desert when Satan challenged him to turn stones into bread. And Jesus said, human beings live not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Moses was telling the people it was not manna that would continue to feed them, but the Torah, the five books of the Bible at that point, um, see a connection with the five barley loaves, the words of God. Christ himself is the incarnate Word of God. And even, even then, people are thinking, well, Moses did this. Moses gave us this. No. Moses asked God for assistance, and God provided. They ask for a sign because prophets work signs to show their authority from God. Jesus has done lots of signs already, and far more powerful signs than they'd ever witnessed or even heard, but they're still looking. Okay, well, you know, prove it. Prove it to us. Uh, they're asking for works, but Jesus is asking for them faith. Faith in him is the sign that he is God's representative. Jesus is telling them that faith in itself is a work of God. The work of God is to believe in him. It's not like, okay, I gotta do this and I gotta do that. I need to come to faith. And faith is always rewarded. You look in the Gospels, every time Jesus encounters faith, even from pagans, that faith is rewarded. He always recognizes. It's not like I do something and you have faith in me, but you have faith in me and I act. And that's a major turnaround for us. We really need to say, okay, no, the faith goes first. Then, you know, when people came to him for healing, they believed that he could heal them. And so he did. They believed he could do something to help their sick child. And so he did. Um, it's having that faith that gets rewarded by the work of God. Not, okay, God, you, you do something and I'll, I'll believe in you. So they ask again, implying that if they saw a really convincing sign, something greater than they'd ever witnessed before, then they'd believe in him. That is, they'd believe in what he's saying. Now, I grew up sharing a room with my older brother, who my mother called the saint. And she might have been right somewhat, because I remember him talking about religious stuff. I wasn't the least bit interested. Um, but I remember one Sunday, probably at bedtime, so because we're in bed talking, and he's he's talking to me like, I just want to go to sleep. But how difficult it is to believe. And we were kids, and he said, you know, if, if I was there with Jesus, it would be so much easier to believe and believe in him. You know, if I saw these things, and I should have known, because this didn't come from me. This was just, you know. <laughs> I said, well, look at the people who were there with him and saw what he did. And they still didn't believe. So seeing is not necessarily believing. Believing is believing. And believing, and as I look back on it now, believing is seeing. Um, you know, and, and he kind of, subsided with that opinion. He thought, I ah, suppose that's right. Look at us. Look at Judas saw everything he did and he betrayed him. So you could be another Judas. Love to call my brother that. Uh, but the fact is that, you know, he, he understood that. Well, that's true. What's wrong with people? <laughs> um, faith doesn't come, you know, you know, 
you do something and, and, and I, then I'll believe in you. Because if you choose not to believe, it doesn't matter what is you witness. You're not going to believe it. You're going to say, oh, that's interesting. But not, I believe. Jesus calls the work of our work is to believe. To believe in his word, the word made flesh, who comes to us in the person of Christ. Um, the crowd says, you know, our fathers ate manna in the desert. Um, the crowd already sees Jesus as the new Moses. Uh, his multiplication of loaves and fishes links him to Moses' greatest miracle, the feeding of the multitude with manna, uh, the bread from heaven. Therefore, they think that he's referring to manna, and so they ask him to pr provide manna as Moses did, as a sign. Because that was something different. That wasn't just loaves of bread and fish. Their challenge is to Jesus, what Moses gave us was bread from heaven. If you are the new Moses, can you do the same? In order to appreciate the significance of this request, it's important to keep in mind there was a general belief that the Messiah, when he came, would come as one greater than Moses, the great national prophet hero of Israel and the signs that he would accomplish. Remember, the notion of Messiah was not the Messiah that Jesus came to be, not the Messiah that God promised to send, just our thoughts twisted around what we want to believe. And so we continue. Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the bread from heaven, the true bread. For the bread of God is the bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread always. Jesus answered them, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever hunger. No one who believes in me will ever thirst. Well, Jesus identifies himself here with a very particular phrase, I am, the name given to God. I am who am. So he's making that connection that Moses was a servant. I am. I am part of God. And remember, they didn't have any concept of Trinity, so this is all brand new revelation to them. Um, so he's, he's not just a guy like Moses that you know God worked with, but something greater. It is God made manifest in Christ. But here and elsewhere in John's Gospel, that I am forms the prelude to an explanation of a, of a parable. In this case, the parable is in action and not in words. The gift of manna and the multiplication of loaves are explained by Jesus as parables of the gift of himself, the true bread from heaven, the word made flesh that give us, gives us life. There's a twofold misapprehension on the part of his questioner. First, with another solemn amen, amen, he tells them it's not Moses who's the giver of manna. Moses is only the instrument of God's action. It's God himself who provided that manna. Moses didn't miraculously create manna. God did. Secondly, Jesus tells the people that the manna, while it was, in a sense, bread from heaven, was not the true bread of God. The true bread, who is the word made flesh, uh, well, all bread is the gift of God. The bread, which can be described as particularly of God, is that bread that doesn't simply give bodily nourishment, but gives the greater gift. The greater gift, of course, is life. Not life, you know, we can eat as much bread as we want and, and live until we die, um, but life eternal. That gives spiritual life, that nourishes who we truly are, who we are created to be. So what distinguishes the true bread from the manna is the bread of God brings life. In the present tense, it indicates that which is continually giving life, and it's offered to all, not only to a particular nation or people, not to these, this group of grumbling people who were in the desert looking for food, but the, the bread God gives is life 
for the world. The bread of life descends from the heavens to give life to the world. Now, something that's a parallel between the manna and the true bread in Christ um, is that it's needed daily. If you look back and see the, uh, the gift of manna, there was, they collected up what they needed for the day. There was no leftovers. There was no Tupperware that they kept, <laughs> kept extra manna in. God gave them what they needed that day. And they needed to trust that God would feed them again tomorrow. It's not about, okay, thanks, we're good. No, that we, they needed God daily. We need God daily. We need the word of God made flesh, the word that came down from heaven on our lives daily. And so often in our lives, it's like um, the touch and go. Okay, yep, okay, I, I, I'm good. I'm good for now. I'll, I'll continue on and, until I need you again. No, we need God in our lives every day. And if we don't understand that, then we're still caught up in, in ourselves and not caught up in the wisdom and the will of God. The expression in verse 33, uh, that which comes down from heaven, uh, is sometimes translated also as he who comes down from heaven. John repeats that seven times in this discourse. It is extremely important. Seven times, the number of perfection, the explicit announcement Jesus makes is, I am the bread of life. You need me daily to continue to, to live. Well, not physically live, but to spiritually live. To, to continue to grow in spirit that that might persevere and not wither. Um, the crowd was quite prepared for the idea of this uniquely heavenly bread but was not prepared for the statement that I am the bread of life. You know, the word manna means, what is it? Because they didn't know, they'd never seen anything like this before. Um, manna sounds so much better than the translation of, what is that? Um, Jesus is the same thing. What is this? How can you say that you are the bread of life? Um, it was the new manna. It was the manna that was that blew them away, just as the people who were starving in the desert said, "Wow, what is this?" Um, Jesus primarily means that he gives himself the Word made flesh um, to give life to us. This twofold promise is similar to the promise he made to the woman of Samaria. Remember. He says, no one comes to him will ever hunger, and no one believes in him will ever thirst. Again, faith precedes um, life and growth. Faith first, God will take care of you. And Jesus is going up to, to take up Satan's challenge in Matthew 4, when he says, you know, the, the, you, know you could make these stones into bread if you wanted to. The living word of God is going to transform hearts of stone by feeding them the word, the true bread, which has come down from heaven. So he will convert these stones who hear him, some of them, um, with the word that he brings um, himself, that true bread. So, to say. Now, John may be picturing Jesus' wisdom personified in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. Wisdom is personified throughout Proverbs, but in Proverbs 9, um, wisdom invites all people of all nations to her table. So too does Jesus invite all to come to him and be filled. In Proverbs 9, wisdom has built herself a home. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has displaced, that she has slaughtered her beasts drawn her wine, laid her table. She has dispatched her maidservants and proclaimed from the heights above the city, who is simple? Let him come this way. To the fool, she says, come and eat my bread. Drink the wine which I have drawn. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
Jesus is that Messiah, the living bread, um, and that abundance that supremely satisfies all who come to him. It's interesting that wisdom calls for the simple, to the fool, because people who don't think of themselves as simple and fools are, are still asking, what do I need to do? What, what is it that I have to do to do God's work? It's like, no. Those who are simple realize, no, I, I can't do God's work. And those who are considered foolish don't even try. They're simply saying, what can I do? Um, and, and have a, a really well-grounded sense of themselves and their own humility. So we continue in John 6. But as I have told you, you can see me and still do not believe. Everyone who the Father gives me will come to me. I certainly will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I have come from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Now the will of him who sent me is that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but there I should raise it up on the last day. It is my Father's will that whoever sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and that I should raise that person up on the last day. As I said before, seeing is not believing. Uh, seeing is not enough. One must do. Faith moves us to, to do. Um, God is not a spectator sport. Church is not a spectator sport. If you're just sitting there, not responding, just like a lump, you're not attending. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had someone who came in for daily Mass, uh, came in late, just in time for the Gospel, but picked up a bulletin and stood there by the edge of the aisle, going through, looking, look, talk about extremely distracting, as I'm proclaiming the gospel, to the point where, and I don't usually ever say anything. I usually kind of go, but I could. The gospel of the Lord, praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Close the book. And I just looked up and I said, there's nothing in the bulletin that is, a, that is import, as important as the gospel. And instead I got excuses. Well, you know, I'm here for a while. Um, so, I don't think I got through it, that person. Um, it's, it's not just sitting there and being a lump. It's actively listening, participating, responding. If you can, singing. And I don't mean if you can, if you can't sing. If, if, like, if the restrictions are lifted where you are and they allow singing, sing. If you don't have a good voice, it's the voice God gave you, tough. He has to listen to it. That's his problem. Our job is to be active in what we do, not simply to sit and watch. I hope for those of you who are following Mass on with a live stream I, I do on Sundays, I really hope that you're responding, even if it's just you and a computer. If I say, through Christ our Lord, there should be an amen coming out from you, not just sitting there like, It's not, like I said, seeing is not enough. We have to do. We have to be. Um, and if we're embarrassed, well, then we're embarrassed about God. And God will be embarrassed about us when Jesus comes to judge. Uh, to come to Jesus in faith is to accept and believe in him without any formal declaration. Jesus is speaking of those who have been begotten by the Holy Spirit which is what we do in baptism. We are sons and daughters of God. We are now collectively one in Christ. And he says, I will not reject. A literal translation could be a very strong negation. Of, I will surely not cast out. He's not here to throw us out of heaven. He's here to guide us to do, that we might actually do the work we can do. And that work is that work of faith, that he might work in us, we might show that goodness um, in our lives, in our, our following. There's a three-part claim that Jesus makes here. 
First of all, everyone from the from the Father, everyone the Father gives him, comes to him. Secondly, he, Jesus, will not reject anyone who comes because he came not to do his own will, but to do his Father's will. And his Father's will is that none of us are rejected. And lastly, the Father's will is that none should perish of those he has given to the Son. They are in his safekeeping, <coughs> and they will be given the gift of eternal life and be resurrected in the final judgment. Now, we're in line by line. Uh, John six thirty eight came not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. The human will and the divine will of Jesus um, and the Father are, are in accord, but only because Jesus continues to seek the will of God. We wonder, Jesus prayed, we know Jesus went off and prayed, and it's like, what's he doing praying? Well, he's praying to, to know the will of God, to follow the will of God, and accept the will of God, even to the end. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he gets uh, convicted, tortured, put to death. Um, he says, you know, his will, because he is human, and he is sane, so, you know, if this could pass me by, I I would, I'd be all in favor of that. But ultimately, and you know, that gets compressed in scripture. It's like that he says, but your will, not mine. Well, I'm sure there was a lot of praying going on there to finally say, okay, this is your will, and I came to do your will. Um, so Jesus reminds us because Jesus doesn't simply speak the talk the talk, he walks the walk. That it's about following God's will, not my own will. As good as my will is, I have some great will. <laughs> but it's not God's will. And that's why we take the time to pray. That we might do as Jesus did, to know the will of God, to follow the will of God, and to accept the will of God, even when it's not something we want. To say, okay, I'm going to trust I'm going to have faith that you know what you're doing. And I'm going to try to follow your will as best I can. Next, I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me. But I should raise it up on the last day. Jesus speaks of the last day when he will raise up. Uh, the day of Jah Yahweh's judgments in history. The believers he will raise to eternal life. This is something that they would be familiar with um, because you know, the prophet Amos talks about the, the day of Yahweh, the, the day when the Lord comes. However, Amos doesn't paint a very a nice picture. If Amos chapter 5. Uh, Disaster for you who long for the day of Yahweh. What will the day of Yahweh mean for you? It will mean darkness, not light. As when someone runs away from a lion only to meet a bear then goes into his house and puts his hand on the wall only for a snake to bite him. It sounds like a nightmare lived up. Um, Amos is talking to people who have turned away, who have not followed, not sought the will of God. And when it, everything has been given to them, he warns them, you know, don't we just wait for the, the day of judgment because it's a day of judgment. And... Um, we will be judged as we live our lives. And, you know, trying to run away and hide, there, there's no hiding. Um, the power of God comes to us. The light comes from us. We can't, we can try to hide in the shadow, but the light of God makes sure that there is no shadow. There's only light. And that light reveals everything. But we get so caught up in ourselves that it's going to reveal me also reveals God, reveals that perfect love that God is, perfect love that Jesus came to show us and to live that we might say, oh, I'm not perfect in my love. I'm not even close. But I, he sent his son that we might follow. We might know that perfection and say, yes, that's 
that's what I should be doing. I should have faith and allow God to perfect me. Let the word of God transform me into the person he wants me to be. Meanwhile, as we continue, the Jews were complaining to each other about him, saying, I am the bread that's come down from heaven. They were saying, surely this is Jesus, the son of Joseph whose mother and father we know. How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Much like the Jews in the desert when they were escaping uh, Egypt, they complain. Uh, they're great complaining people. They're just, you know, uh, and so they're complaining about, what's he talking about? He, uh, we, you know, he might be able to pull the wool over other people's eyes. We know his family. And how can he say he's come down from heaven? They're thinking only of Jesus' earthly origins. They know his family. Jesus telling the crowd that this disturbs them with the statement, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Jesus is expressing his divine origin. Not only did they not get it, they didn't want to get it. They want, God has to work my way. I want you to work the way I want you to work. Here, this is what I want you to do. It's not about that. It's about what is it that you want me to do? It's about God's will, not making God into to me. You know, I'm going to make God into a human being. No, God already did that in Christ. Um, that we might be made divine. The crowd has been given a revelation by the new Moses. If they accept him as the prophet Moses, they are required by God to listen to him. So it's the crowd's response. They're behaving just like their ancestors, uh, complaining and limiting what God can do on their behalf. Ah, we'd be better off slaves. Right? That way we wouldn't be hungry. It's like, um, has God not freed you? Has God not worked in powerful ways in your lives? And yet you're going to complain about something as simple as we're hungry? Instead of going to God, saying, God, we are tired and we are hungry and there's, nothing, and there's nothing we can do short of going back. And there's never going back. You, you, we never called to go back. We're called to move forward. Even if we made mistakes and moved in a bad direction, we're still called to move forward. To let God correct those mistakes and, and keep us on his path, not our own. So Jesus said to them in reply, Stop complaining to each other. No one can come to me unless they're drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. For it is written in the prophets that all will be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learnt from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except him who has his being from God. He has seen the Father. And all truth I tell you, amen, amen, everyone who believes has eternal life. What have we been saying over and over again? Well, you give me eternal life and I'll believe in you. Let me believe and that life will come. That life will follow. Jesus is continuing his teaching of his divinity when he quotes Isaiah. And I told you before, Isaiah is my favorite of the Old Testament prophets. Um, where he, he describes a new Jerusalem. In the New Jerusalem, all your children will be taught by Yahweh, and your great will be your children, and great will be your children in prosperity. Goes on to say, Oh, come to the water, all you who are thirsty. Listen carefully to me, and you will have good things to eat and rich food to enjoy. Pay attention, come to me, listen, and you will live. There we have come to the water, or sacrament of baptism, where what? We, we are, the old is washed away, that the new may be a child of God. And then come for good things to eat, rich food to enjoy. Listen, and you will live. The sacrament of the Eucharist. We do at Mass. We listen, and we consume. We, we enjoy. That's the promise of eternal life. 
Jesus goes on. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert, and they are dead. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that a person may eat it and not die. I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Again, trying to understand God in human terms. And they're not getting it. They will think about cannibalism. They will think, okay, if Jesus is truly the word made flesh, we are eating the word of God. We are consuming the word of God. That word that has all the power. The word, that, the word that created the world, the word that continues to work in our lives if we consume that word, physically and uh, symbolically as we listen, as well as consume. Now this is the second statement Jesus identifies himself again as the bread of life. The giving of Jesus' flesh and sacrifice for the life of the world connects the incarnation, the word made flesh, with the crucifixion. I am giving myself to you. And what do we do? Do we exalt him? No. He is beaten, um, spit on, stabbed in the side, and nailed to a cross. It's a great example to us. How do we treat the word made flesh? When God's word comes to us, are we still acting as as they did 2,000 years ago? Or are we welcoming that word and saying, I may not fully understand. Nobody fully understands. In fact, when I first started theology, I thought, what a waste of time. How could we possibly understand God? Well, it wasn't a waste of time. It opened up. It taught me how dumb I was. <laughs> the more I learned, the more I realized that God was greater. That no matter what I learned, God was greater than that. And if you come out of that thinking, I've got a God all figured out, then it didn't work. If you come out figuring, wow, anything I think, um, God is going to be greater than that. So it doesn't mean stop thinking. It just means remember, let God be God and let me be me. Notice the future tense Jesus says. The bread that I shall give. He's not talking about the loaves and the fishes. He's talking about the sacrifice on the altar of the cross where Jesus becomes um, Eucharist. Uh, his sacrifice which becomes present for every generation beginning at the Last Supper. He's talking something that he knows even though they don't understand and they probably didn't even catch on that he was referring to the future. Jesus is not only the, the true bread because he comes from God, he is God's word, but also because he is the, the spotless victim whose flesh and blood is offered in the sacrifice for the life of the world. Not offered by us, offered by himself. Remember his dialogue with uh, Pilate. No, you have no power over me unless it's given to you from above. And Jesus didn't, he handed over his life wasn't taken from him because they and we have no power over God but the love of God manifest in Christ gave it over and said I offer myself for your sin the animal offered in sacrifice dies in, in place of the sinner now this idea of mystical sacred meal was not foreign to these believers in the Old Covenant. Uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, the blood of the sacrificed animal was poured out on the altar, and then the animal was skinned and its meat was roasted on the altar. With the exception of whole burnt offerings, every sacrifice was eaten by the priests, or on the occasion of Passover, um, it was eaten by the people. The sacrifice was consumed. Nothing would go to waste. Animal sacrifice for sin ended with the Old Covenant and the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem at 70 AD. That's, it's kind of jarring 
to visit the Holy Land and to hear them say that, oh, well, when we rebuild the temple, we'll be able to have animal sacrifices again. And we're thinking, really? That, that seems so barbaric. That just doesn't seem like, you know, we've come a long ways from there, but um, that is the hope that oh, we can still have these animal sacrifices. That they didn't lead us to life. It was that Lamb of God who sacrificed himself for us that led us to life. And it's that sacrifice we still need to participate in. We still need to, to consume, eat of that sacrifice. Peter writes in his first letter, You are a chosen race, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a people set apart to be a personal possession of God. This, of course, again, stuck in human mindset and our little, our little brains that are locked in this brain box here. Um, this doesn't make any sense. Again, instead of being open to the word of how God works in our lives, they keep trying to, you know, remember the, the, the golden calf? They're going to build God the way they think God should be why they thought cows made of gold were just a wonderful thing, but uh, in any case, um, we still do that. We still try to make God in our image and likeness. And so, the Jews started arguing among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus replied to them, Amen, amen, I tell you. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Anyone who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life. Anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life. And I shall raise that person up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in them. As the living Father sent me, and I draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will also draw life from me. This is the bread that has come down from heaven. It's not like the bread our ancestors ate. They are dead. But anyone who eats this bread will live forever. How can he give us his... And, and you can understand somewhat. Um, how, how can this be? We're not supposed to eat and drink people. That's, that's, that's not right. That's definitely not kosher. Literally. Um, but again, Jesus is speaking broader than our own little narrow concepts. And he has done things. He's fed 5,000 with five fish and two, uh, two fish and five loaves of bread. Do they question that? No. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a neat trick. Well, how, how is this to be? Remember, the Word made flesh. Jesus is the Word. We are to consume that word, not our words, the word of God, who teaches us, if we are willing to be taught, um, the path and the way of God. Jesus came to live that, to show us how it can be done, because the words apparently weren't enough. We weren't getting it. So God became enfleshed in Jesus. The word became flesh to show us how to follow, how to to understand and to seek the will of God. That's why, it, as much as we might say, why did Jesus pray? It's like, why did he waste his time? No. He prayed to be one with God's will. And that's what we're supposed to do. Not, not to change God's will to our will, but to, for us to be changed to follow God's will. If we eat that bread, we seek his wisdom. We seek eternal life, not just what's on the menu for today. Jesus is speaking literally and sacramentally. He's using very strong language. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't not know this, um, that his flesh must be eaten and his blood we must drink. Um, here are two Hebrew or Aramaic idioms. One was much akin to our expression of flesh and blood, meaning life. Um, you take the flesh and blood of something, it's 
the life force of someone. We, for example, express family relationships. They are my kin, they're my flesh and blood. Uh, or we use the flesh and blood as a reference to the human condition. The second, to eat flesh or drink blood, is, comes from the drink the blood of the enemy, referred to in the horrors of the war. Jesus was using either of these idioms. He would, have, if he was, he would have used the words flesh and blood, or eat the flesh together with, in one phrase. But instead, he used very distinctly separate words and phrases, so it leaves no doubts. To the meaning. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, not the enemies, not something else, um, I live in that person. To eat his flesh and drink his blood is to consume life itself, that supernatural divine life. And so in doing so, we become elevated to his divine nature. It's really important to understand and we can get so caught up in the and even theologically since this is the week of prayer for Christian unity um, people who get caught up in the well no that's that's no that's not what he meant it's like it's what he said you know take what he said as as what he meant um, but in the Eucharist it's we are becoming uh, who we eat you're real you are what you eat as we consume not just the Eucharist the Word of God, the whole sacrament. We don't just do the liturgy of the Eucharist, it's it's Mass, it's the whole thing. As we consume that, we become part of the divine nature that is Christ. And I was so happy to see that Pope Francis wrote this, and I copied it so I would read it specifically, correctly, not paraphrase, because it is what I have believed for most of my adult life for people who don't receive communion because they think, oh, I, I, I shouldn't receive communion. Pope Francis writes, the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine, a nourishment for the weak. Well, if it was a, I tell people, if it's a prize for the perfect, we'd save a lot of money on hosts because we wouldn't need any. <laughs> um, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. Well, that means we have to admit our weakness. We have to acknowledge that we need God. And especially when we're caught in our weaknesses and we think, oh, I shouldn't do this. I, I'm, I know I've, I have failed in my own weakness and I've sinned. Um, let, me get, let me get well and then I'll take the medicine. It doesn't work that way. I need the medicine to get well. I need the strength to get well strong, not to, to, to not be weak anymore. I can't do it on my own. And God gives us that in Christ. Gives us that in the Eucharist. So that we truly can become what we eat. What we receive from God will transform us into just meat bags <laughs> from, from that to something holier, something greater. That which God created us to be that we keep wandering off the path. Now, these are the words uh, the disciples will recognize when they receive the Eucharist from the hands of Jesus in the upper room a year later um, at the Passover meal before Jesus uh, dies. Jesus will say, the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. In that upper room, take it and eat it. This is my body. Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. They fully understand. Otherwise, we would have heard that someone bit Jesus on the arm. That they're not <laughs> eating this flesh. Or opening a vein and drinking. Just not be vampires. They understand that something different is occurring. That he who is the word sent to us is doing something different. As God always does something different and we keep trying to make God do what we want you to do. This isn't, this isn't right. Jesus is not teaching cannibalism. Uh, and that's a charge that Christians were executed for in the second century uh, for insisting that he indeed were eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. The definition of cannibalism is eating of a human who is dead. 
Jesus is not dead. He is more alive than we are in his glorified flesh. The restrictions under the Old Covenant were against consuming flesh and blood on a natural level over a lower level of life. This was forbidden under the law of the covenant. Genesis, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy in several places talk about, no, this is, this is an abomination. However, to consume Christ does not pull us down to the level of animals that elevates us to the life in Christ. We consume Christ, we do not consume Jesus, the, the, the human being, that man. It's the Christ that we consume. So for those of people who say, oh, you know, and, and what I do with kids, with, um, I don't think I want to taste the blood. It's like, doesn't taste like blood. Just as the host doesn't taste like bread either, but um, it, it's, it's not, we're not eating Jesus. We are consuming the Christ. And we're consuming that Christ not to bring Christ down to our level, but that we might be who we eat. We might be who we consume. We might be lifted up to the level of Christ. There's a prayer that I'm supposed to say um, when I'm preparing the altar. We mix the water and wine. It's like uh, Christ who humbled himself to share in our divinity that we may share in his humanity. I mean, humbled himself to share in our humanity that we, we may share in his divinity. And for many years, I never said that because I thought, who are we to, to share in, in Christ's divinity? That, that's, that's kind of cocky of us. It was only you know, in, in latter years that I finally realized that it's not us. It's not, you know, we're not elevating ourselves, but it's the gift of God. It's nourishing that divine that spark, that divine life that's in us. All right, I have a couple of minutes to finish this. This is what he taught at Capernaum in the synagogue. And after hearing it, many of his followers said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his followers were complaining about it and said, does this disturb you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Now he's, he realizes they're talking about cannibalism and how that's just, you know, that, that this is crazy. This is crazy talk, and, uh, especially to an Orthodox Old Covenant Jew or an Israelite. Uh, believe, people believed he was speaking literally and demanding cannibalism, which was forbidden. But there was more to their outrage than that. We look at Leviticus. It says, if any member of the house of Israel or any resident alien consumes blood of any kind, I shall set my face against that individual who consumes blood, and shall outlaw him from his people. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you for performing the rite of expiation on the altar for your lives, for blood is what expiates for a life. To consume flesh and blood would cut them off from the old covenant community. And the Holy Eucharist, Believers are eating Christ's glorified body and drinking his glorified blood. He does not intend to cut us off from God, but to cut us off from the old covenant, which he said didn't lead to salvation. It only led to law. We follow the law, and the law does not give life. Love gives life. After his resurrection and ascension, the old covenant will be fulfilled and transformed. So the purification and sacrificial rites will be fulfilled. We no, need, no longer need to spill the blood of animals. Christ himself, God has spilled his own son's blood for us. But the moral law is intensified and internalized in a covenant that is internationalized. It's offered to all nations, not just to these people. It's offered to all people. What Jesus is suggesting here is that we should see the Son of Man extend to where he was before. Well, we know that the disciples will, at the ascension, um, will seeing that even be proof enough. At his ascension, he goes up, and however, they didn't need the proof. By the time the ascension came, 
faith was there, and then they saw the miracle. That's, that's putting the horse before the cart, that we might have faith and recognize then the power of God in our lives. Um, if those of you who are still digging out, good luck, stay safe, no heart attacks, please. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. God bless.